Alison Utley used to tell stories to her little boy as they walked through the fields and woods. Her tales were based on the country people and tradition she knew when she was a child in Derbyshire at the end of the last century. When her son went away to school, she wrote the stories down so that he could read them in the holidays. The first was published in 1929, and there have been many more since then, about the adventures of Little Grey Rabbit and Hare and Squirrel, and all their countryside friends and neighbours. The first story is called Fuzzy Peg Goes to School. It was bedtime and little Fuzzy Peg the Hedgehog sat by the fire in his nightgown eating his bread and milk. His mother was mending his blue smock which he'd torn on his prickles. Old Hedgehog hung up his milking yoke and came into the cosy room. Please tell me a bedtime story, implored Fuzzy Peg. Old Hedgehog rubbed his hands and scratched his head, trying to think of a nice tale. Then he began to chant the song of the frog. The frog he would do woo in gold, whether his mother would let him or no. Hey ho, says Roly. Fuzzy Peg beat time with his spoon on the wooden bowl and Mrs. Hedgehog forgot to thread her needle as she listened. When he had sung the poem, Mrs. Hedgehog took a length of thread, and Fuzzy Pig finished his supper. What a lovely tale, cried Fuzzy Pig. How clever you are, my dear, Mrs. Hedgehog exclaimed. I learned that in my school days when I was a youngster, same as Fuzzy Pig, said Hedgehog modestly. Can I go to school and learn poems? asked Fuzzy Pig. I think he's big enough, don't you, Hedgehog? And Mrs. Hedgehog looked at her husband. Yes, it's about time he had some education, replied Hedgehog. You can't get on without some education. Just think what a lot Wise Owl knows. And Miss Squirrel and Little Grey Rabbit, said Mrs. Hedgehog. And Hare, added Fuzzy Peg. He taught me to play knots and crosses that day I got lost. And that's not wisdom, explained Hedgehog. That's rubbish. Can I go to school tomorrow? Please, please, Fuzzy Peg asked, jumping down from his stool. Yes, if I've mended these holes in time, Mrs. Hedgehog told him. And Fuzzy Peg hopped round the room for joy. <laughs> The next morning he awoke early and sprang out of bed in a great hurry. I'm going to school today, he sang as he rolled downstairs in a prickly ball and bounced into the room where Mrs. Hedgehog was cooking the breakfast. Old Hedgehog had been out since dawn, milking the cows and carrying milk to his customers. Fuzzy Peg saw him returning, so he ran to meet him. The Hedgehog carried something under his arm and Fuzzy Peg danced round asking what it was. Wait a minute, don't be in such harem scarum hurry, it might bite you, said old Hedgehog, smiling. He gave Mrs. Hedgehog the milk for breakfast, and then he sat down and slowly opened the parcel. He took from the leafy paper a little leather bag, and Fuzzy Peg turned it over with shrill cries of excitement. A school bag, a school bag, look mother, where has it come from? Grey Rabbit gave it to me when she heard you were going to school. Your lessons, sums and poems and tales, said Hedgehog. And your sandwiches for elevenses and your penny for the schoolmaster. Then they all had a good breakfast and Fuzzy Pig started off for school with the leather bag on his back. As he went down the lane, he saw his cousins, Tim and Bill Hedgehog, who lived in the cottage in the larch wood. 
Hello, Fuzzy Peg, they called. Where are you going with that fine bag? I'm going to school, said Fuzzy Peg proudly. Wait a minute, we'll come too, cried the little hedgehogs. Mother, mother, they shouted excitedly. Can we go to school with Fuzzy Peg? Yes, if Fuzzy Peg is big enough, so are you, said their mother. She brushed their quills and tidied their smocks and cut their sandwiches and sent them off. I say, do be quick, you fellows, cried Fuzzy Peg through the doorway. We shall be late. Late? What's late? asked Tim. I don't know. It's something we mustn't be, replied Fuzzy Peg. I specs we shall learn all about it at school. They trotted along the lane when who should they see but Hare lolloping along in his bright blue coat. Hello, Fuzzy Peg. Hello, young'uns, he called. Have you seen it? I've lost it again. No, said the little hedgehogs, shaking their heads. Seen what? asked Fuzzy Peg. Yes, seen what? said Tim and Bill. My shadow. It's not anywhere about. I don't know where I put it. Perhaps it's in Robin Postman's nest, suggested Fuzzy Peg, and he knocked at the door of a neat nest in the daisied bank. Yes, w -w 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 what's the m -m -m matter? asked the postman. Have you seen Hare's shadow anywhere about? asked Fuzzy Peg. No, 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 no. Has he lost it? The little postman stared at Hare, and then he looked up at the sky. Of c c course he hasn't a sh shadow, Robin exclaimed. N -n -n None of you have sh 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 shadows. The three hedgehogs looked behind and before them. No, we haven't. Oh dear, we can't go to school without shadows, they cried. W -w -w Wait till the s -s -s sun comes out and then your sh 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 shadows will leap back to you, advised the robin. And he went in and shut his door. What's inside your bag, Fuzzy Peg? Hare asked. Sandwiches, replied Fuzzy Peg, and he brought them out and divided them. Now you've plenty of room for other things, said Hare, and they gathered bindweed, forget-me-nots, eyebright, foxgloves. These are all lessons, said Hare, and if you'll sit down on this bank, I will teach you your ABC. All the animals came close to him and listened very hard. A. Hay grows in the daisy field when the sun shines and the mowers come, said Hare. I like hay. I helped make it once with Grey Rabbit, said Little Fuzzy Peg. B. Bees live in gardens and come buzzing and humming at you. They get honey and that is a very good thing, said Hare. I've been stung by a bee, said Tim Hedgehog. C. Seas are very wet, very wet indeed. They are all water and they never dry up, said Hare. We shouldn't like to fall in, see, said Fuzzy Peg, and the others agreed. Oh, no, 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 we don't like sea, said they. That's all for today. You know your ABC, said Hare, suddenly springing to his feet and running off, for he had spied Little Grey Rabbit coming towards them. Little Grey Rabbit came tripping along the path with her basket on her arm. When she saw the three little hedgehogs sitting on the grass, she was astonished. What are you doing here, Fuzzy Pay? she asked. I thought you were at school. Please, Grey Rabbit, we're waiting for the sun to come out. We can't go to school without our shadows. Of course you can. Now run along as fast as you can, or your teacher will be very cross. So off they ran, under the gate to Daisy Field, and across that lovely flower-filled meadow to the little pasture where Jonathan Rabbit had his school. They pushed aside a leafy curtain, walked along a passage through the gorse, and knocked at a little green door with a brass knocker, hidden in the low bushes. The door swung open, and they entered a room whose walls were made of closely woven blackberry bushes and wild roses, whose floor was the soft, fragrant turf of the pasture, 
starred with wild thyme and blue milkwort and sweet clover growing over it like a pattern in a carpet. The ceiling of the schoolroom was the blue sky, where the sun was now shining so that the little hedgehogs saw their shadows at their side as they walked shyly across the room to old Jonathan. <coughs> Benjamin the Hedgehog, Timothy Hedgehog, Fuzzy Pig Hedgehog, said he, writing their names on a rose leaf. Remember that school begins at nine o'clock, and don't be late. They sat down on the mossy bank which ran round the room by the side of several little animals, hedgehogs, squirrels, rabbits, the young hare, a small mole, and some field mice. They all read from books made of green leaves which Jonathan gave them. Then he asked them some questions, and all the little animals stood up in a row, with Fuzzy Peg at the end. Which flower helps a rabbit to remember? he asked. Nobody knew the answer, but little Fuzzy Peg drew the blue forget-me-nots from his lesson bag and held them up. Quite right, Fuzzy Peg. Go to the top of the class, said Jonathan approvingly. Which flower shuts its eyes when it rains? he asked. All the little animals shut their eyes and tried forget-me-notting. But Fuzzy Peg held up the white trumpet of the climbing bindweed. Then Jonathan asked his last question. Which flower makes gloves for cold paws? Every animal knew the answer, and they all shouted at the tops of their voices, Fox gloves, fox gloves! before Fuzzy Pig could get the purple foxglove from the bottom of the satchel. Now for counting lesson, Jonathan continued. One, two, buckle my shoe, sang the animals, and all the little hedgehogs fastened their shoes, but the squirrels and mole and the rest, who wore no shoes, had to look on. Three, four, knock at the door, they sang, they ran to knock on the brass knocker, tat-tatting like a postman. Five, six, pick up sticks, they sang, and they all ran into the pasture and gathered as many sticks and twigs as they could carry. Seven, eight, lay them straight, they sang, and each tried to lay his sticks in even lengths, which was very difficult. Now Jonathan had enough sticks for his fire, so he put them in a pile and lighted them. Then, whilst he rested from his labours, he sent the little animals out to play. Eleven o'clock, said he, blowing at a dandelion clock. Go and eat your sandwiches. Suddenly, Fuzzy Peg saw a little figure in a grey dress with white collar and cuffs coming across Daisy Field towards the school. Here's little grey rabbit, little grey rabbit, oh, grey rabbit, cried all the animals, and they rushed to meet her and begged her to sit down and tell them a story. She sat on a tuffet in the shade of a hawthorn tree and began the tale of Red Riding Hood. she just got to the part where Red Riding Hood came to her grandmother's cottage and pulled down the bobbin and all the little animals were pressed close to her, their eyes wide open, their ears listening to every word she spoke when there was a mighty roaring noise close by from behind the hawthorn tree. Woof! 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 I'll nab you, it said in a terrible deep voice. Oh, 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 shrieked the little hedgehogs and squirrels and field mice and hare and mole. Oh, the wolf! Boo, boo, woof, came the strange voice. So close they felt the creature was upon them. It's the wolf, they shouted, and they all ran helter-skelter up and down the field seeking for shelter. Great Rabbit stood very still, for she thought she recognised the voice, though it was different in some way. Woof! Woof! I'll nab you! roared the creature gruffly. Come out, Hare! 
said Grey Rabbit sternly. Hair? Naughty hair. Come out at once. I know that voice. You can't deceive me. From behind the tree leapt Hare, holding a cone-shaped trumpet made from the bark of the silver birch tree. Ha ha! I frightened you. You thought it was a wolf, didn't you? All the little animals came creeping out to stare at the trumpet which Hare carried, all except the youngest rabbit, who was far away, galloping along the leafy lane's home, and Fuzzy Peg. Where's Fuzzy Peg? asked Little Grey Rabbit. Where's Fuzzy Peg? echoed the others. Then they heard a squeaky little voice. <laughs> Help! <laughs> From out of the stream crawled a very bedraggled little hedgehog, with his satchel on his back and his smock all covered with water weeds. Is very wet, he said. <laughs> Poor little fuzzy peg, said Grey Rabbit, running up to him. You'd better go straight home to bed. School dismiss, shouted Jonathan. A horrid day. No more school today. You've done quite enough lessons. And the little animals all leapt up and down, crying, "A holiday! A holiday! Oh, a holiday!" I didn't want a holiday. I've only just begun," <laughs> said Fuzzy Peg in a quivering voice. <laughs> But Grey Rabbit took him by the hand and hurried him home, whilst Hare ran alongside. Little Fuzzy Peg was popped into his warm bed with a bowl of delicious gruel and black currant tea. Grey Rabbit sat at his bedside, and she sang little songs to him, while Fuzzy Peg sneezed and chuckled and sneezed again. Then Hare put his head in at the door. "I brought you some of my treacle toffee," said he. "I made it myself, so you may be sure it's nice, and it's a fine cure for a sore throat." I'm sorry you fell in the water, Fuzzy Peg, old chap. He'll soon be better," said Grey Rabbit. "I'll come home with you now, Hare. Goodbye, Fuzzy Peg." Fuzzy Peg croaked, "Goodbye, Grey Rabbit. <coughs> Goodbye, Hare." <coughs> and then he shut his eyes and slept till his father came home. What did they learn you besides swimming, my son? Asked Old Hedgehog as he stood at the bedside, looking at Little Fuzzy Peg muffled up in his blankets. Straw, wasps, and ponds," said Fuzzy Peg dreamily. "No, no, Father, I don't think that was what Hare taught me. It was hay, bee, and sea." I fell in the sea, Father. And tomorrow we're going to learn. Here we go gathering nuts in May, and I'm going to have the youngest rabbit for my nuts in May. <laughs> I like school, Father. You've not learned much," said Old Hedgehog. And they say a little learning is a dangerous thing. You'd better get a bit more knowledge tomorrow, and don't go to Mister Hare for your lessons neither. And that is the end of the story. This is the story of Water Rat's picnic.
One day, Water Rat came out of his house by the riverside and strolled down his garden path. The garden was full of riverbank flowers, bright blue forget-me-nots, water mint and yellow flags. He picked a sprig of flowering rush and fastened it in his buttonhole. Then he whistled a sea shanty and went towards his boathouse. There lay the neatest, prettiest little boat you ever saw. She had a pair of slender oars like scarlet wings. She was made of polished elm, and the name, the Saucy Nancy, was picked out in gold letters. A couple of cushions lay on the seat, and a water jar was in the bow. On this particular fine day, Water Rat took a duster from his pocket and whisked the specks from the boat. Then he stepped back and looked at her with admiration. He took the stone jar to the spring and filled it with clear water. He polished up the copper kettle and packed the picnic basket. Water Rat took up the oars and rowed some distance. He moored the boat to the roots of a willow and leapt out. Then he walked across the fields to Grey Rabbit's house. His short legs ached as he went up the garden, for he was a water animal, and field paths tired him. He tapped at the door. Come in, come in, called Grey Rabbit, who was busy making strawberry jam. Oh, Water Rat, how pleased I am to see you, she cried when she saw her friend. Do sit down and rest. I shan't be long now. The strawberries are bubbling. Grey Rabbit ladled the jam into a row of little glass jars. She covered each with a strawberry leaf and tied it with a blade of grass. <sighs> That's finished. She sat down by Water Rat and fanned her hot face. I came to invite you and Squirrel to go for a picnic, said Water Rat. My boat's moored by the old willow and the food's aboard. A picnic? A boat? cried Little Grey Rabbit, clapping her hands. A boot, a real live boot, called Squirrel, dancing in on tiptoes. A picnic, a real live picnic, shouted Hare, popping his head in at the window. I'm afraid my boat will only hold three, said Water Rat coldly. Oh, that's all right, said Hare. You can swim alongside, Water Rat. You're a fine swimmer. Uh, there'd be nobody to row, Hare. Besides, you're too big. You capsize my saucy Nancy. Hare frowned and stamped his foot. He came into the room and stood in front of Water Rat. Look here, he cried. Do you mean to say you're going on a picnic without me? Oh, it's impossible. I've never been left out. I am the life and soul of every party. What is there to eat, Water Rat? Egg and cress sandwiches, marigold sponge, water mint jellies, lobster patties. Stop, stop moaned Hare, wiping his eyes. This is too much. This will be the death of me. I shall never get over the shock. Never! He sank half fainting on a chair, and Grey Rabbit and Squirrel hastened to loosen his collar. Little Grey Rabbit fetched a glass of primrose wine, and he sipped it with little groans. Then he peeped to see the effect upon Water Rat. Poor Hare, sighed Grey Rabbit. Poor dear Hare. I'm afraid we can't go, Water Rat. We can't leave her behind, said Squirrel. I have a plan. Water Rat spoke rather crossly. Yes, what is it? What is it? They all asked, and Hare opened wide his eyes and forgot to faint. Surely you can run faster than the saucy Nancy, Hare. Suppose you race along the river bank while I row Grey Rabbit and Squirrel. Then you can choose the place for the picnic, and we'll all have a feast under the trees. Oh, that's a good idea, said Hare. I much prefer to run along the bank. It isn't the boat I want, but the picnic. Then that's settled. Water Rat breathed again. They shut the windows and locked the door and put the key under the mat. Grey Rabbit carried a pot of strawberry jam, Hare his fishing net, and Squirrel a pretty little sunshade. 
they tripped along by Water Rat's side, asking questions about the boat. Oh, how beautiful, cried Grey Rabbit when she saw the saucy Nancy under the willow branches. You shall steer, Grey Rabbit, said Water Rat, and Squirrel shall sit on a cushion. He helped them both into the boat and untied the rope. Goodbye, goodbye, called Hare. I shall meet you soon. Take care of the food and don't fall in the river. He galloped along the bank and they waved their paws to him. Soon he was out of sight. Squirrel leaned over the side to watch the fish playing hide-and-seek under the boat's shadow. Grey rabbits steered past small rocks and islands. Water rat rowed with light, graceful sweeps of the scarlet oars. He pointed out many strange sights of the water highway. There was a scurry and flurry and a loud quacking as a flock of white ducks came hurrying up. Quack! Quack! Where are you landlubbers going so fast? They asked. For a picnic, said Water Rat. Don't come too near, you shake my boat. One duck snatched Squirrel's sunshade and carried it off with peals of quacking laughter. Another pulled the strings of Grey Rabbit's apron and untied it before poor Grey Rabbit could protest. Water Rat sprang up, but another duck grabbed his frill the duck swam away with the little blue apron draped on her shoulders. Another twitched the ribbon from Squirrel's tail, and a fourth seized the pot of strawberry jam. There was such a commotion, such a rocking of the boat, and a flash of feathers, and a splash of water, that nobody noticed another duck seized the picnic basket. It's outrageous, exclaimed Water Rat. Then he started. What's that I see? He stared at one of the ducks. Is it? Oh, can it be? Is it possible? Has she taken the picnic basket? The duck held the little picnic basket and tried to open it. She couldn't unfasten the wooden pin, and as she struggled, the basket slipped and went down, down, down to the bottom of the river. Ooh, ooh, cried Squirrel and Grey Rabbit. I'll get it, muttered Water Rat, and he took off his velvet coat and dived overboard. Down to the bed of the river he went, and there, lying among the water weeds, he found the basket. He put his arms round it and swam back to the boat. He hauled it over the side and clambered after it. Then he sat upon it and rowed as fast as he could away from the ducks. They were so busy playing with Grey Rabbit's apron, twirling the little sunshade and eating the strawberry jam, they took no more notice of the boat. It's lucky it's lined with Mackintosh, said Water Rat. All my things are waterproof as I live by the river. It won't be any the worse, but I'm sorry about your apron, Grey Rabbit, and your sunshade, Squirrel. I will make another apron, said Grey Rabbit cheerfully. And I will have one of those big round leaves for a sunshade, if you will pick it for me, Water Rat, said Squirrel. Water Rat picked the lily leaf, and Squirrel held it over her head, and tried to forget her sunshade. Where's Hare? asked Water Rat, staring at the river bank. He ought to be somewhere waiting for us. I'm hungry. It's time we had our picnic. Ooh, called Grey Rabbit. Came a faint reply, but there was nobody to be seen. Water Rat pulled the boat to the shore and looked around. From out of the reeds peered Hare, his coat torn, his net broken. Oh dear, he cried. I've been chased by a dog 
and pestered by rabbits and tossed by a bull and bitten by gnats. Oh dear, and you've been rowing peacefully on the river. <laughs> Not so peacefully, laughed Grey Rabbit as she climbed to the bank and ran to meet Hare. I've lost my blue apron, Hare. And I have lost my sunshade, added Squirrel, leaping lightly out of the boat. Yeah, we nearly lost the picnic basket, said Water Rat. Oh, that would have been a calamity, muttered Hare. A cal cal calamity. The thought of the picnic basket kept me from despair. He took the basket from Water Rat and clasped it to his heart. Then he sat down under the silver birch trees to nurse it. Now and then he peeped through the meshes or tried to unfasten the catch, but the basket was tightly shut. Grey Rabbit and Squirrel ran about picking up sticks, and Water Rat carried the kettle and water jar to the hollow by the trees. Pile up the wood, make a big fire, called Hare, and they heaped the sticks ready. Now, now for the matches, said Water Rat, and he took the box out of its Macintosh cover and struck a light. The fire crackled and yellow flames shot up. Soon the kettle began to sing in its high, shrill voice. What does it say? asked Squirrel, leaning over to listen. I'm nearly boiling, I'm nearly boiling, I'm quite boiling, take me off, said Water Rat. That's what it says. He unfastened the picnic basket and spread out the dainties. Grey Rabbit and Squirrel gave little shrieks of admiration as they took the three blue mugs, three blue plates and three tin spoons from the fitted basket. Hare leapt for joy when he saw the patties and sandwiches and jellies in the Macintosh wrappers. Oh, what a feast there was! They laughed and sang and told their adventures and quite forgot their troubles. Hare was very hungry, for he explained he had run for miles while they had been resting in the boat. I was chased by a rabbit and tossed by a gnat and bitten by a bull said he, as he took the last sandwich. Bit and bar, bull rush, you mean, said Water Rat. This is very nice jelly, Water Rat. I'm glad you rescued it from the watery grave, said Hare, and he finished off the water mint jelly. They took the cups to the river edge and washed them and dried them on the grasses. They hunted in the moss for the little tin spoons and they repacked the basket. Then they sat down among the buttercups and daisies to watch the river whirling below them. Hare crept softly out of sight and climbed into the boat. He untied the rope and pushed her out into the stream. You didn't know I could row, he called, splashing with the scarlet oars. It's quite easy. Oh, oh, Hare, take care, shrieked Squirrel as the boat rocked dangerously. Sit down, Hare, commanded Water Rat. You'll upset her if you stand up. Your boat's so wobbly, said Hare, swaying to one side. If I move, she rocks like a cradle. Steady on the steady. He sat down with a thump, and the boat shook. He dipped the oars deep in the river and dragged up some weeds. Then the oars waved wildly. Hare's feet flew up, and he shot backward into the water. Save me! Save me! I'm drowning! He cried, kicking and struggling. Out of the shadows came the company of ducks. They circled round poor Hare and grabbed him by his fur. One got his left ear, another his right, another his leg, and the fourth his coat-tail. Then they swam to the shore with him. Quack, quack, thanks for the strawberry jam. They quacked as they pushed him on the bank, and away they went, cackling with laughter. Quack, quack. Squirrel and Grey Rabbit dried him with their handkerchiefs and squeezed the water out of his fur. The poor bedraggled hare crouched over the embers of the fire, shivering. <laughs> it's very wet in the river. 
he said, with his teeth chattering. I, I n never knew that, that b -b 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 boat wasn't s s s safe. Water rat should never have invited us. We shall all be d -d 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 drowned going home. You will have to run, said Grey Rabbit. It'll keep you from catching cold. Water rat swam after the little boat and the pair of oars which were floating down the river. He rowed back and dried the boat and wiped the cushions. I told you how it would be, said Hare sternly. You would bring your old boat for the picnic. It isn't safe. It never ought to be on the river. He started off along the river bank, trotting with head bent. The others seated themselves in the boat. Water Rat rowed swiftly, and soon they were back at the old willow tree. Oh, thank you, dear Water Rat. Thank you, thank you, they said, and they scampered home as fast as they could. Hare, Hare, they called as they went into the house. A violent sneeze shook the house, and loud bangs came from Hare's bedroom. They ran upstairs. There was Hare with his feet in mustard and water, and his head in a blanket. <coughs> sneezed Hare. I thought you were both drowned. Make me some elderflower tea, Grey Rabbit, and make me some gruel with sugar in it, Squirrel, quick! <coughs> Squirrel and Grey Rabbit raced round with herbs and hot water, and soon Hare was snug in bed with his basin of gruel and a teapot of elderflower tea. Pit-pat, pit-pat, pit-pat. Little footsteps came flipping to the door. There was muffled laughter, and a shuffle, and flop. Grey Rabbit looked at Squirrel, and Squirrel looked at Grey Rabbit. Oh, what can it be? They whispered. Pit-pat, pit-pat, pit-pat. Little footsteps went flipping down the garden path, flip-flopping over the grass. Quack, quack, quack. The little grey rabbit stepped softly to the door and opened it a crack. On the doorstep lay her blue apron, rather torn and dirty, and very wet. Oh, how glad I am to get my little apron again, she cried, and she hung it by the fire to dry. But the sunshade never came back. The ducks liked it so much they wouldn't part with it. Any day you could see them swimming down the river, one of them carrying Squirrel's sunshade, and another playing with Squirrel's ribbon bow. hollow oak tree in the middle of the wood. Anyone could see it was Wise Owl's house, for a little silver bell with an eagle on it, and curly lines like a shell round its edges hung beside the front door. The house was very old and very untidy. Dust and dirt of ages filled the rooms, and cobwebs hung in festoons from the ceilings. There were attics and storerooms all over the tree, filled with lumber and old wood and spiders. Wise Owl never went into these rooms, for he kept to his kitchen, his bedroom, and his study. In the bedroom, there was a little four-poster, with a small carved owl perched on each bedpost, and on it lay a goose feather bed. In the kitchen was a frying pan, but in the study were all Owl's books of wisdom. Round the walls were shelves, 
and there the books were arranged, books in green, brown, and beautiful red bindings, exactly the same colours as the leaves of the trees. One evening, just as dusk fell, Owl yawned and got down from his easy chair where he'd been dozing. He sniffed at the cool air which came through the window. The wind had changed, and there was a strange rippling motion which he felt at once in his feathers. Hmm, storms brewing somewhere, said he to himself. There'll be a gale tonight. I must shut the windows before I go out or my books will get wet. The clouds came hurrying up, whipped by the rising wind, and White Owl flew off over the woods and fields. He had to go far that night before he found his supper. of the wind and the echo of a crash awoke Hare in the little house at the end of the wood. My goodness, it'll blow my whiskers off, he cried, and he pulled the bedclothes over his long ears. Squirrel shivered and curled her tail closely round her shoulders. Little grey rabbit in her attic opened her eyes and listened to the creaking of the trees in the wood. After a time, she heard a strange wailing voice, which seemed to come from somewhere near. I've lost my home, moaned through the night air. But when she sat up in bed, she heard nothing except the screech of the wind. I was dreaming, said she. When Wise Owl's hunting was over, he tried to fly back to his tree, but the wind blew him out of his path, and he was very tired with buffeting against the blast. He knew the wood so well, he could find his way home blindfolded. So, with eyes half shut, he blundered on towards his front door. But it wasn't there. He gasped with surprise and circled round. But there was no silver bell, no little brown door, no great oak tree. Then he looked down to the ground, and he saw the oak tree stretched there like a fallen giant. The door was broken off. Books lay scattered on the grass, a dictionary floated like a white lily on a pool of rainwater, and the silver bell had gone. Oh, woe is me, woe is me, cried the owl. To wit, to woo, what shall I do? His great wisdom deserted him, and he was just a lonely, unhappy owl, very wet and very tired with no home to rest in. dropped, but the rain poured down. The little rabbit could hear the patter of the drops on the roof as she dressed, and she looked from her window at a drenched world. I wonder what that crash was I heard in the night, said she to herself. I'll just slip out while the others are asleep. She slipped a cloak over her shoulders and ran out in the wet, down the path to the wood. When she got near Wise Owl's house, she saw the fallen tree, and the broken door, and all the tumbled wet books. Oh, poor wise owl, what will he do with no home? she cried, and she gathered up some of the books and put them under the tree for shelter. She looked round for wise owl, but he was nowhere to be seen, so she hurried back with her sad news. We must all do something, said Hare as he ate his porridge. Yes, let's do something really useful, said Squirrel, and she sipped daintily at her tea. Should we invite him here as our guest 
till he finds another house? Asked Grey Rabbit. Here, exclaimed Hare, puckering up his face. In this house? Grey Rabbit, are you mad? He'd break our cups with his wings, said Squirrel. He'd be asleep all day when we wanted to tidy the house and make the beds. Besides, his ways are not our ways, she shivered. No, it wouldn't do, agreed Grey Rabbit. He must have a house of his own. He must have a nice big house to hold all those books of wisdom which I saw lying in the rain. There was silence for a moment, and then Grey Rabbit said, Suppose we go out and look for one for him. Can't he do that himself? grumbled Squirrel. He doesn't like the daylight, you know, and at night he's too busy, said Grey Rabbit. We will wait till the rain stops, and then we will take sandwiches and spend the day house hunting. Sandwiches? Splendid, cried Hare. I love house hunting. He ran to the door and looked out. There's a rainbow in the sky, Grey Rabbit. We can go quite soon. The three animals set out on their expedition through the wood, but although they looked to the right and the left, high up and low down, they couldn't find a hollow tree. Let's all go different ways, said Squirrel. Then, if we haven't found a house by tea time, we'll go home. And have plum cake for tea, sighed Hare hungrily. And hot buttered toast, said Squirrel. Hare tossed the straw in the air to see which way he should go, and then he set off down an inviting little green path. He soon found himself out of the wood in a wet green meadow. There in the grass grew round, white, satiny knobs. Oh, mushrooms, he cried, and he filled his pockets. He forgot all about Wise Owl's house as he wandered about the field. Squirrel started off along a little path in the opposite direction, but soon she saw a hazel tree with round brown nuts clustering upon it. She sprang up the boughs and feasted, cracking the shells and nibbling the sweet kernels. Then she curled up in a corner and went to sleep, for the leaves were fragrant and the branch was soft. She forgot all about Wise Owl and his home as she lay curled up high in the air. When she awoke, it was too late to bother and she gaily danced her way home. Little Grey Rabbit ran along the path to the west, looking to right and left for a hollow tree. She dodged in and out, sniffing and searching, and she marked each tree with a tiny white cross so that none should be overlooked. She worked so hard, she did not notice that the afternoon had passed and evening was approaching. She tapped the trees and marked them, moving farther and farther from home, until at last she heard the sound that she'd been listening for all day. She stopped in front of a great beech tree and tapped again. It was hollow. Here was a house for Wise Owl. She ran round the trunk and pulled away the brambles and leaves which concealed the opening. Then, rather frightened, she went inside. There was a splendid empty house. It was rather damp, of course, but a little fire would soon dry it. There were three rooms, and lots of attics, and shelves all round the walls. It was just right for Wise Owl. She went to the door and looked out. The moon was rising behind the hill, and a soft golden glow spread over the wood. A moonbeam shone into the doorway, and lighted up a pool of water on the ground. Grey Rabbit thought of Wise Owl just starting on his rounds, and she felt frightened. She thought of her home, and the supper table, and bright fire, the ticking clock and the cosy hearth, and she felt very lonely. She didn't know where she was, and there was nothing to be done except to stay there all night.
Hare went home, he found Squirrel reading one of Owl's books. Where's Little Grey Rabbit? asked Hare. Hasn't she come home yet? No, she probably met Wise Owl and they talked about tails and bells and hollow trees, said Squirrel. She'll come soon. They had tea without her. But when supper time came, and there was no Little Grey Rabbit, they both grew anxious. Hare put a lighted candle in the window to light her home, and then he stood at the door and called, Cooey! 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 His voice rang through the air, but there was no answer. Cooey! Cooey! He called again, and... shrill voice hooted nearby. Hare started. Who was that? Where did that noise come from? Wise Owl came out of the woodshed, yawning with wide open mouth. Did you call? He asked coolly. We've lost Grey Rabbit, explained Hare nervously. What is she doing out late like this? asked Owl. She's looking for a house for you. A house for me? echoed Wise Owl. I am going to live in your woodshed. It's warm and comfortable and there's plenty of food about. He stepped into the house and snapped up all the mushrooms and hot buttered toast which lay ready for supper. Squirrel dived under a chair and lay there shaking with fright. Hare fidgeted on one leg and said nothing. I'd better go off and find a grey rabbit said Wise Owl. You stay here and wait up for her. You'd be lost if you came too. Wise Owl flew over the woods calling, but either the tree was too thick or Grey Rabbit was too fast asleep. She never heard his voice and he had to return without her. Hare and Squirrel were very much alarmed for Wise Owl was a famous finder of lost animals. I'm going to sleep now, said he. Don't disturb me. You too must go out and look for her. Now hurry up, commanded the owl as he stood in the doorway. No dilly-dallying, no shilly-shallying. The two animals sprang up and got ready with sticks and map and compass, and owl returned to the woodshed. There was a sound outside. The door was pushed open and in came Little Grey Rabbit, looking as fresh as a daisy. She had washed in a stream and brushed her hair with a teasel brush. Wherever have you been? cried Hare. We were just going to look for you. Owl was out hunting for you all night. Little Grey Rabbit turned pale. To find you, not to eat you, said Hare crossly. We never went to bed, and here you are, looking as if you've been enjoying yourself. I'm so sorry said Grey Rabbit humbly. I got lost. I must have walked in a circle, for I was really quite near Owl's old tree, and I didn't know. I found a home for Owl. Oh, thank goodness, exclaimed Hare. This is a nice house, Grey Rabbit. Owl is in the woodshed, and he won't go away unless it's a nicer house than ours. Couldn't we spring clean it for him whilst he's asleep, and put his books inside, and then he will want to go? asked Squirrel. Oh, yes, cried Grey Rabbit, who loved to polish and scrub. They took buckets and mops and scrubbing brushes and soap and walked off to the wood. Grey Rabbit led them to a beautiful beech tree with golden brown leaves spreading in a tent overhead and thousands of beech nuts hanging from the branches and spilling onto the warm earth. Ooh, I shouldn't mind living here myself, said Squirrel as she cracked the three-cornered nuts and ate the tiny kernels. We will take some of these home for beech bread. It's a fine tree, said Hare, but where's the door? Grey Rabbit pointed out the small hole near the ground. Owl won't want to fly down to the earth when he comes home, objected Hare. 
I don't think he'll change from the woodshed. Then he added hurriedly, Excuse me a moment, I've forgotten something. I must run home. And away he went. He doesn't want to scrub and rub, said Squirrel crossly. But Grey Rabbit took her into the tree, and she forgot her disapproval of hair as she explored the rooms. It's a very nice house, said she, fit for a king. They filled their buckets from the pool nearby, and they scrubbed and mopped the floors and walls and ceilings. They washed the little shelves and bookcases and the cupboards which hung all round the tree. Owl will be able to keep all his books here, said Squirrel, and she put some pointed chestnut leaves on the floor for green carpets. There's a place for his blotting paper and his pen and ink and... Tape measure and thimble, interrupted a voice and Hare came in, carrying a saw. What is that for? asked Squirrel. It's a saw, to saw things, said Hare. You never thought, but I did. He sat down on a bench and folded his arms. Do you imagine that Wise Owl would live here with that door? Why, he couldn't get through it without crawling. I said to myself, that owl will want to live in our woodshed if we don't do something. So, I'm going to make a door high up so that he can fly right in and no burglars can get into his rooms. He climbed up the steep stairs and cut a neat door in the tree. He fastened hinges of springy bark so that no one would notice it. And then he cut a window in Owl's study, which was very dark and dismal, and put another in the kitchen. A nice airy house with every modern convenience, said he proudly. The three animals went to the oak tree and collected the books, which were now dry with the wind and the sun. They carried them across to the new house and arranged them on the shelves. They picked up Owl's cuckoo clock, which hung in a bush. Cuckoo, 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 it struck. Is this one of Owl's magics? cried Squirrel. I wondered why the first cuckoo was always heard in this wood. They hung it on the staircase and returned for Owl's rush-bottom chair and three-legged stool, his feather bed and frying pan. Hare found the sealing wax and squiddle the candlestick, and Little Grey Rabbit found Owl's nightcap dangling in the nettles. But nowhere could they see the little silver bell. The house was finished, and they stood in the grass, staring up and admiring the shiny grey trunk of the tree, and the sloping boughs with the little door hidden among them, when Hedgehog walked up. Hello, said he. I just found Owl's bell. I was walking along the path through the wood and I heard a tiny tinkle, tinkly tinkle, and there was a mouse playing with Owl's bell. Did you ever hear the like? A mouse with Owl's bell? A bold mouse, said Hare. Little Grey Rabbit took the silver bell and examined it. It was none the worse, but she rubbed it and polished it. Then Squirrel ran up the tree and hung it at the side of Owl's front door, and the four walked back to the little house at the edge of the wood. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wise Owl, they cried, tapping on his door. Wake up, there's a new house for you in the wood. Don't want a new house, muttered wise Owl sleepily. Go away and play. Your books are on the shelves, said Hare. Your cuckoo clock's ticking on the stairs, said Squirrel. Your nightcap is on the bed, said Grey Rabbit. Your bells are tinkling by the front door, said Hedgehog. Wise Owl came out and blinked at them. Did you say you would put my tree up again? he asked. No, we found another, a better one said Little Grey Rabbit. Without another word, Wise Owl flew off, flapping silently away in the daylight, never heeding the crowd of small birds which followed after. They twittered and cried, but Owl saw the silver bell, and he pushed open the door. He walked upstairs one step at a time, and he looked in all the cupboards and on the shelves. He counted his books, and only one was missing. The nursery songs which Squiddle had taken home with her but Owl knew those ditties by heart. He threw open the round window which Hare had made, 
and looked at the great roof of the tree above him. He ran his beak over the smooth floor and smelled the sweet sawdust which lay in a pile on the floor. I must give a present each to the squirrel, the hare, and the little grey rabbit, said he. They've certainly done me a good turn. Something for something has always been our motto. He searched in his treasure box, which was buried deep in the brown leaf mould of the wood, and he took them. What do you think? A tiny basket, carved out of a cherry stone. A sailing boat, made from half a walnut shell. A little beech tree, growing out of a beech nut. Now, can you guess which had which? That's the end of the story. The last story is called Hare Joins the Home Guard. Squirrel and Hare sat at the table waiting for breakfast. The toast was made and the kettle was boiling on the fire. Little Grey Rabbit warmed the teapot and put in three spoonfuls of daisy tea. She poured the boiling water over it and placed it on the table under the tea cosy. Then she gave Hare a big bunch of lettuce and Squirrel a middle-sized bunch and on her own plate she put a very little bunch of leaves. There was brown bread and honey and nuts and a pat of yellow butter from the Alderney cow. Where's the milk, Grey Rabbit? asked Hare. We can't drink tea without milk. He munched his lettuce noisily and frowned at Grey Rabbit. Where's old Hedgehog? asked Squirrel, delicately cracking a nut. I'll see if he's coming, said Grey Rabbit. He's never been as late as this. Something must have happened. Grey Rabbit ran to the door and looked about her. Then she spied Hedgehog the milkman. He was trotting quickly along the lane with his cans of milk. Good morning, Hedgehog, called Grey Rabbit, and she went to meet him. The milkman stamped up the path and looked through the doorway at Squirrel and Hare. He put down the milk cans and waited for Grey Rabbit to get her jug. Have you heard the news? he asked importantly. What news? asked Hare, and he held up his empty mug. Where's the milk, Hedgehog? We want milk, not news. There nearly was no milk. Nearly was never a drop, replied Hedgehog crossly. He filled Grey Rabbit's jug and then stood gazing very sternly at all of them. What's the matter, dear Hedgehog? asked Grey Rabbit anxiously. There's a war, said Hedgehog. That's what's the matter. A war. A war? What's that? asked Hare, and they all looked puzzled. A war is a battle coming on us. Yes, cows was that upset they kicked over my bucket when I told them and toppled me over. I had to begin milking all over again. Why were the cows upset? asked Grey Rabbit. And the milk upset? asked Hare. And you upset? asked Squirrel. Because there is a war. Bang, bang, cows don't like a noise. Who is going to make a noise? asked Grey Rabbit. I, I don't know. Somebody's on the war path. I'm off to find out. Keep indoors and mind yourselves. Don't get hurted. Good day to you all. Hedgehog took up his pail and trotted down the path. Squirrel, Hare, and Little Grey Rabbit all talked at once as they sipped their tea and ate their crisp lettuce and toast. Perhaps it's a fox or a billy goat or a weasel on the wall path, said Hare. Perhaps it's a wolf, faltered Squirrel. Or a mad bull, went on Hare cheerfully. Tap, rap a tap There was a flutter of wings and Robin the postman appeared on the doorstep with his bag on his back. He held out a leafy letter to Grey Rabbit. Ha ha have you ha 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 the news? He asked. Yes, there's a war. There's a war, cried the three friends all together. 
Tell us about it, Robin. It's the war of the weasel. There's an army of them c -c -c coming to attack us, and you better get ready. They're c -c coming from the faraway woods to invade our p -p 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 peaceful little land. He shook his post bag and showed them all the leaves which brimmed it. All these little little letters to deliver this morning, he boasted. Every b -b 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 body's got a letter today. We've all got to wake up and arm ourselves with, 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 with spears and arrows against the invading weasels. And away he flew. washing up the breakfast things and were making the beds when there was a pitter-patter of little feet at the door. Goodness me, the enemy's here, shrieked Hare, and he and Squirrel dived under their beds, leaving Grey Rabbit to face the army. She peeped through the keyhole, and there stood her old friends, Mouldy Warp and Water Rat, with a company of timid rabbits and squirrels from the woods. We've come to hold a council of war, said Mouldy Warp and he rapped on the door. Who killed it there? said Squirrel in a faint squeak. Friend or foe? called Hare in a thin, high voice. It's Mouldy Warp, the mole, laughed Grey Rabbit, and she flung wide the door and ran to welcome him. There wasn't room inside for so many, so they sat in the garden and held council. The weasels are on the warpath, said Mouldy Warp. Where is the warpath? Yes, where? asked the rabbits. It's that long lane, the old Roman road, which runs through the woods to the hills as straight as an arrow. That's the war path. It comes close to your house, Grey Rabbit. The army will march down here. Mrs. Hedgehog and her husband came hurrying up, and the speckledy hen bustled through the gate with a loud cluck. She was helping Fuzzy Peg to carry a basket of eggs. We brought ammunition, said Fuzzy Peg, panting up the path. We brought these to throw at the weasels. These are old laid eggs, explained the speckledy hen. The hen that always lays astray left them long ago in the hedge. Capital, cried the mole. They'll be deadly. Bring more if you can, speckledy hen. He looked round at the company of excited, quivering little animals. Here. You shall be the home guard. You must defend Grey Rabbit's house and all our homes with your life. Hare shivered, but he drew himself up proudly. I'm used to being the home guard, said he. I always put the key under the doormat. Squirrel, said Mo, turning to the little knitter. You must knit socks and stockings and mittens and scarves for all our fighters. Squirrel nodded and clicked her needles. Grey Rabbit, you must be a nurse and take care of the wounded, said Mole. What about me? asked Hedgehog. I may be old, but I can fight. I once killed an adder with my prickles. You're a brave fellow, Hedgehog, nodded Mole. I shall want you to be a leader, a captain. Water Rat will guard the river banks. Owl will fly over the woods and watch for the approach of the enemy. All the rest of the animals will be fighters, hidden on the warpath with bows and arrows, with pop guns and swords and daggers. Will there be anything to eat? asked Hare. The weasels will do the eating if we don't stop their advance, replied Mouldy Warp coolly. We must rid our land of these pests before we think of eating. I thought there'd be sandwiches provided, said Hare sorrowfully. I can't fight on an empty stomach. I'll make you some sandwiches, Hare, whispered Grey Rabbit. Just then, a crow came cawing to the garden. Caw, caw. They're coming afar off, Mouldy Wall. They're marching down the Roman lane, sweeping everything before them, eating everybody in the path. They'll be here before the sun gets over the sky. Caw, caw, caw. A shiver of excitement went round the circle. Every animal to his post, commanded Mole. Get ready to meet these invaders and turn them back to their own wild land. Away they all rushed 
to find weapons and to carry out Mole's secret plan. <laughs> Grey Rabbit's house all was bustle and stir. Hare ran upstairs and downstairs, calling, Grey Rabbit, where's my catapult? Grey Rabbit, where's my haversack? Grey Rabbit, where's my helmet? Where's my red coat? Where's my umbrella? Where's my pistol? Make me some sandwiches of egg and watercress, Grey Rabbit. Squirrel was knitting so fast she used eight needles at once. Little Grey Rabbit sewed a red cross on her blue apron. She tore up a sheet for bandages, and she packed a pincushion with thorns for pins. She fetched her ointments and her cures for all hurts from the corner cupboard, and she brewed some herb tea ready for the wounded. She made some sticking plaster with the sweet gum of the larch trees, and she put a bottle of violet smelling salts in her bag. Hare strutted up and down with his catapult. On his head he wore a saucepan, and covering his chest was a dish cover. He carried his gas mask on his back, and round his waist was a belt which held an ancient toy pistol he once found. I'm off to face the foe, he cried. Do do do. He played a tune on his trumpet and beat the dish cover like a drum. Why do you want a butterfly net? asked Grey Rabbit. That's a gas mask, said Hare proudly. My own invention. I shall wear it when Fuzzy Pig throws the old laid eggs at the weasels. Tweet, doo, called Wise Owl in a long drawn cry. Doo, get to your places, they're coming near. An army of weasels was marching along the old grass covered Roman road. Their teeth shone white. Their noses were raised. Their little fierce eyes looked here and there as their long, thin bodies moved swiftly over the ground. Mouldy Warp was working furiously at a trench which cut the old road. Deeper and deeper he went, and a band of rabbits with wheelbarrows were piling the soil high. What are you making? whispered Hare, leaning over the trench to look at Mole. An ambush, muttered Mouldy Warp. A ambush, echoed Hare, and he walked off to find Grey Rabbit and Squirrel. Mole is making an egg bush, said he. No, no, a ham bush. Ham and eggs for the weasels, he explained. At last the deep trench was finished, and the animals threw their sharp thorns and furze bushes over the bottom of the long pit. Across the top they spread a layer of twigs, so delicately placed that they would snap with the lightest touch. Squirrels dropped grasses over the gap, and Robin the postman came with a mailbag full of leaf letters to sprinkle there. A ham and egg bush, whispered Hare to anyone who had time to listen. An ambush, corrected Mole. A trap to catch the enemy. Now hide yourselves with your pop guns and don't move a whisker, he told the rabbits. Squirrels! All of you, climb the trees and wait with your bows and arrows. So the squirrels climbed the trees and the little rabbits hid in the bushes with their pop guns pointing towards the pit in the lane. They were shaking with excitement. They couldn't keep their whiskers from trembling. Fuzzy Pig and his cousins were crouched behind some dock leaves and in the nettle bed beside them were the old laid eggs. Throw your bombs in the trench. When the weasels fall into it, said Mouldy Warp, be ready with your bombs and throw them at the enemy. Tramp, tramp, went the feet of the weasels down the green lane towards Grey Rabbit's house. Their long bodies moved in snaky columns as they followed their leader. Suddenly, Wise Owl dropped like a stone and carried off the big weasel at the front of the army. The rest squealed in surprise and hesitated. Those at the back marched on, and the foremost were pushed on the thin layer of twigs over the pit. Down they went, one on top of another, falling head over heels into the ambush Mole had made, 
At the bottom of the pit were the thorns, like a bed of spears to prick them. Fire! Fire! shouted Mouldywarp, and bang went his old blunderbuss among them. A shower of little arrows and a hail of little stones fell among the scrambling weasels. Then Fuzzy Peg and Tim and Bill Hedgehog threw the old laid eggs. Every egg hit a weasel and knocked over a dozen others. Whew, what a smell there was. Hare put on his gas mask and fired his sandwiches from his catapult by mistake. It wasn't until his haversack was empty that he discovered his mistake. Oh, just my luck, he murmured. Excellent egg and cress sandwiches all gone, and I've got stones to eat. The weasels struggled and fought and rolled about in the pit. A trap! A trap! they cried, and they climbed on each other's backs and scrambled out. Away they went, over the fields, across the woods, many a mile to their own wild country. We will never go to Grey Rabbit's house again, they told each other as they licked their wounds and crept into their holes. Never! The fiercest animals on earth live near Grey Rabbit's house. <laughs> On the battlefield, Grey Rabbit attended to the wounded. She put bandages round the rabbit's paws and pinned them with thorns. Mrs. Hedgehog carried bowls of hot pea soup to the tired little animals, and Old Hedgehog came hurrying up with a can of warm milk. Where's Mouldy Warp, our leader? Where's Fuzzy Peg, our bomber? Where's Boys Owl, our scout? they asked. Down the lane came Mouldy Warp and Fuzzy Peg, and behind them a crowd of little rabbits and hedgehogs and mice. You shall all come to the Feast of Victory, promised Mole. Now the war is over and the weasels have been defeated, we needn't fear them any more. A feast, cried Hare. Ha, 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 that's better. That's worth fighting for. Hurrah for Mouldy Walk the leader! Hurrah, hurrah! Hurrah for Fuzzy Peg the bomber, cried the little army. Hurrah for Grey Rabbit, the Red Cross nurse, and Squirrel the knitter, and Hare the home guard. <laughs> Thank you.